getting into our first segment of the day we're going to be talking some college basketball so like i mentioned we did have some brief sweet 16 we had some sweet 16 games on friday that we did not get to cover so i'm going to briefly go over those before spending some more time in depth on the elite eight matchups so looking at friday's games purdue pulled away from gonzaga in the second half to win that one it is just another example this game was of you can compete with Purdue for a while, but it is just so hard to keep your best interior defenders on the court through the entirety of the game when you're playing against Zach Eady, Graham E.K., and Anton Watson both fouled out for Gonzaga, and they just were not able to keep pace with Purdue in this one. I'm not quite as upset about some of the calls that Zach Eady gets that other people do, but... I do understand it's not the most aesthetically ap appealing game of basketball to watch when it is Edie going to the free throw line and the best players on the other team not being able to play due to foul trouble. But 7-4 in college is just so hard to defend and obviously other teams are sort of feeling that this postseason. So they advance to play Tennessee who won a close game against Creighton. Dalton Connect continued to sort of struggle with his efficiency, but led the way for the Volunteers with 26 points in that game. The key stat was the fact that Tennessee only turned the ball over four times and grabbed 12 offensive rebounds. So Creighton just let them have far more opportunities than they did offensively, and that really hurt them. Also, the fact that we saw Creighton struggle with having some depth throughout the course of the season. Their, their starting lineup was very well-rounded. We saw that in a game such as Oregon in the second round. But ultimately, Trey Alexander didn't really have his best stuff in this game. And the Creighton team just didn't have a bench to really supplement that. In the South region, we had a couple upsets with Duke over Houston and NC State over Marquette. I do firmly believe that if Jamal Shedd didn't get injured, Houston wins that game. It also didn't help that Jawan Roberts went out for the Cougars as well. So, I mean, credit to Duke for winning a low-scoring game. Their defense has had been very impressive through the NCAA tournament run there, but they end up just sort of coming away with they kept they caught a break really is what it came down to with some of the injuries that took place for Houston and then Marquette couldn't buy a three-pointer in their game against NC State they went four of 31 only two players hit a three for them in Tyler Kolek and Cam Jones they took 60 shots as a whole and they took 31 three-pointers, meaning that over 50% of their looks were threes, and they shot just under 13% on them. So really rough stuff there. Credit NC State's defense some, but Marquette did also get a lot of open looks in this game and definitely led to a disappointing loss where I was shocked to see that Tyler Kolek only had three assists in this game because he did create a lot of opportunities for his teammates and ultimately they Marquette finally was able to break into the Sweet 16 but their run ended there. Now getting on to the Elite 8 games we saw on Saturday, Saturday night one of the craziest runs in the game of basketball with the UConn and Illinois game. The score was 23 to 23 with just about a minute and a half left in the first half and UConn then responded with a 30 to nothing run into the second half for this to take place in an elite eight game against a very good Illinois team obviously conference champions one of the top tier offenses in the country they were ranked the number two offense coming into this game and it's just unbelievable to show how dominant UConn has been during this run. They end up winning the game. The Huskies do 77-52. This was probably the most dominant game of Donovan Klingon's college career. At least that I've seen. I know that he scored 
29 against New Hampshire earlier this year, but I don't really count that one as much. I've been sort of so-so on Klingon as an NBA prospect, but this was just an unbelievable performance from him where he scores 22 points, grabs 10 rebounds, and blocks 5 shots. In the 22 minutes that he played, Illinois only scored 14 points. He completely locked down the paint. I don't really know why the Illini were trying him as much as they were in the post in this game, but Klingon had it knocked had it locked down and in doing so completely eliminated Terrence Shannon Jr. from this matchup. Shannon scored just 8 points on 2 of 12 from the field. This is the least amount of points scored by him all season long, so that was great to see from Klingon. This was supposed to be a matchup between the two best offenses in the country, but instead Illinois only puts up 52. And for good reason, we see UConn being the betting favorite to win it all, and it's for good reason. They have led by at least 30 points in every tournament game they've played up to this point, which is just ridiculous. And in this game, they didn't even really have the three ball behind them. They matched the Illinois team here in in terms of points by just their points in the paint. They score 52 in the paint. Illinois scores 52 in the game as a whole. UConn was just 3 of 17 from 3, and they were able to win by 25 points. Just ridiculous stuff for them. They had more team assists than Illinois had made field goals in the game as a whole. So, again, this UConn team has the potential to really be an all-timer. We talked about this on Friday. There's already the argument that they're better than the championship team from last season, and they really have a chance to solidify themselves as, I do think, one of the best teams possibly in at least recent tournament history, but this two-year run here has been incredible from Dan Hurley and the Huskies. The game of the weekend in college basketball was probably Alabama over Clemson. That also took place on Saturday night. The Crimson Tide come away come away 89 to 82. Both of these programs were looking for the first Final Four appearance in their program's history, and ultimately it's Alabama that comes away with this one. It was a 35 to 32 ball game at halftime. Pretty low scoring for an Alabama matchup. Alabama had missed 12 of their first 13 three-point attempts, which was a very good sign for a Clemson team who really rallied behind their defense and opposing teams missing their threes through their first few wins in the NCAA tournament. Opponents were just 14 of 75 from three headed into this game for Clemson, but both teams' offenses exploded in the second half with each of them scoring 50-plus points, and when you allow yourself to get into a shootout with this Alabama team, things typically aren't going to work out for you. Down the stretch, it was the two teams exchanging threes, which, again, a very dangerous game to play when you're going up against Alabama, and ultimately the better offense came out of this one, led by Mark Sears, who was incredible down the stretch in this one. He went 6 of 7 from 3 in the second half, really sparked the offensive takeover in this one. Jaron Stevenson came off the bench as well. He had a little bit of a shaky start, but he ends up scoring a career-high 19 points and knocks down five three-pointers as well. So Bama went from going 1 of 13 from 3 in the first half to then going 16 of 36, hitting 15 of their last 23 attempts which is just a ridiculous mark for them, but also at the same time isn't too out of character for what this Alabama team has done as of late. I know that I haven't been the highest on the, on them because of their defense, but again, their offense is just so dangerous and it's showed through this run that you know they are scary enough to put up a fight against any type of team and they I felt like they sort of pulled Clemson into their style of game which was beneficial for them 
and ultimately they are moving on for their first Final Four appearance. We'll see what happens against UConn. I don't want to dive into that matchup all too much just yet, but... On the other side of the bracket, we had Tennessee pushing Purdue for the Boilermakers' closest game of the tournament. The only one versus two matchup that reached the Elite Eight, and Purdue ultimately came out on top 72 to 66. This was the a game of two of the Naismith Player of the Year finalists facing off, and both of them showed up where Zach Eady and Dalton Connect both put on a show. Eady came out on top of this matchup, scoring 40 points, a career high for him. Connect accounted for 37 on the Tennessee side of this game. This was the first time in NCAA tournament history that both teams had a single player score at least half of their points, um, the team's total points. There were only three players who hit double digits in this game. It was Edie, Connect, and Fletcher Lawyer added an additional 14 points for Purdue. You can look at the box score for Connect and point to the fact that he took 31 shots, very high volume. And if you didn't watch the game, you might try and point the finger at him. But ultimately, Tennessee was just unable to get anything else going offensively and connect really was just putting the team on his shoulders trying to do the heavy lifting and just nobody else could get it going for them the rest of the team was just 10 of 31 for the field from the field and ultimately that is sort of why they lost this game along with the fact that nobody could guard Zach Eady the volunteers tried to throw out a handful of different looks for them they had Toby Awaka come off the bench and they were hoping that he could be the big time defender but he was only able to play 14 minutes and because of foul trouble which he did late in the fourth I thought that JP Estrella not the biggest guy necessarily not the one that you expected but he's actually 6'11 he just looked so much smaller on the court behind Edie but who doesn't really but the freshman came out. I thought he played just about the best defense as anybody did against Edie in this game. But that's also not saying all too much with Edie finishing with 40 points and 16 rebounds. He also had the block against Connect with 34 seconds left in the game to end up sealing that one. A lot of people were upset with the fact that Edie shot 22 free throws, which was double the amount that Tennessee shot in the game. Again, it's extremely difficult to officiate a player like Edie. I know that a lot of people make the argument that they just don't officiate Edie, and that's the reason why he gets away with it. A lot of people call for he fouls offensively a lot more than the refs ever credit him for, and he gets a foul call every time he's on defense. Honestly, I'm not really here to dispute that necessarily. You do have to understand that at his size, obviously he's going to get fouled more than anybody else in the college basketball atmosphere. It just, you know, it makes sense to me. Free throw discrepancy isn't, you know, this phenomenon that happens. There's a reason behind it, and it's because of the fact that Edie spends as much time as he does in the post. And, you know, when you put up that many shots, obviously it's so difficult to guard him at that size you know in the college basketball atmosphere that more times than not you're gonna end up fouling and I understand it's not you know super appealing to watch but again I don't really feel like diving into whether or not the refs need to change how they officiate Edie it just sort of is what it is and ultimately you know Tennessee had a chance in this game if they had other guys show up on offense and sort of the opposite of what happened in the UConn Illinois game I thought that Tennessee should have tried to attack Edie more than they did we saw connect sort of operating the pick and roll a little bit helped him get to some of his spots in the mid-range that went down but 
there's definitely a difference between Kling in the, in the post defensively and Edie, where, yes, I mentioned that Edie had that block in crunch time that was massive for them, but I do think he's a lot more gettable than Klingen is, and ultimately, when you look at Purdue here, this is a very nice redemption story for as much as of the negativity that they get, almost the fact that they had suffered all of these upsets in the past has additionally had people to call them fraudulent and then they don't play maybe the most appealing brand of basketball to a lot of basketball fans but at the same time I mean they are incredible for as dominant as obviously UConn has been up to this point Purdue has been just around that same level of dominant up to this point Tennessee ultimately pushes them far if they were in a you know, different region here. I think there's a very solid chance they end up coming out, but Purdue was a very tough draw for them, and ultimately it is Purdue moving on to the program's first Final Four since 1980, where they will be facing NC State, who pulled off the upset against Duke. The legend of DJ Burns lives on. 29 points for him in this game really controlled the pace, the slowing the game down, posting up, forcing the extra attention on himself, and when they didn't, he took advantage of the looks that Duke was giving him. Ultimately, it, he was able to carry them in this one. DJ Horn also built off a very strong performance versus Marquette, scored another 20 in this game, felt like he started out pretty slow, and you know, both offenses did when it was a 27 to 21 Duke lead at halftime, but he got it going from there and really helped spark the NC State offense as a whole push in the second half where they outscored Duke 55 to 37. They shot 73% from the field and did not miss consecutive field goal attempts in that second half. Meanwhile, Duke was held to just 32% from the field. NC State has now held their last six opponents to under 40% from the field. So really impressive defensive stuff there from State. Jared McCain was pretty much the only one that came to play offensively for the Blue Devils. He ends up scoring 32 points, which ties Zion for the most points scored by a freshman in the program's history during an NCAA tournament game, he now has two of the three highest highest scoring freshman performances in program history from that same aspect of an NCAA tournament game where he had scored 30 versus JMU. So he has very likely worked himself into being a lottery pick later this summer. Meanwhile, Kyle Filipowski had another pretty disappointing outing. He and McCain are sort of trending in opposite directions here, where Filipowski could potentially be a lottery pick, but had a couple performances here as of late that could hurt him. Ultimately, it's important to remember that tournament games don't mean everything, but he was just 3 of 12 from the field, scored 11 points. He did grab 9 rebounds, but... He also turned the ball over three times and fouled out, was not able to do a good enough job against Burns. Now, he averaged 16 points per game on 51% shooting during the regular season, so again, this was a little uncharacteristic, but just 11 points per game on 43% during March Madness. Not super encouraging from a big man, but... All in all, a very solid season for Duke here where they sort of flew under the radar and ultimately made the Elite Eight. Now, I don't think that their path to make it to this point in the tournament was really all that difficult, not to undermine what they did do, but they only beat one single-digit seed during their run, and that was a Houston team that lost their Naismith finalist player of the year so you know I, if he doesn't go down with injury again I think Houston wins that matchup but NC State really is the story of this you have to be positive about that considering the fact that you look back and there are just so many inflection points during this NC State run where you have to look back at that Virginia game Isaac McNeely an 85% free throw shooter going over 2 from the line 
Tony Bennett and Virginia deciding not to foul while they were up three. And then Michael O'Connell hits the buzzer beater to force overtime. They come out of that, end up winning the ACC tournament. And now here they are in the final four. An extreme pleasure to watch them. Very well rounded and nine straight wins for them. And they reached the Final Four for the first time since 1983. So we now have an NC State versus Purdue matchup, as well as an Alabama versus UConn matchup that is set to take place on Saturday. We will then have the championship game on Monday. So going to be a lot of fun to see, especially that DJ Burns versus Zach Eady matchup. Two very different body types, of course. Um, there was also a story that came out. And I, I'm going to have to look more into it after the show here. But supposedly NFL prospects are buzzing about DJ Burns. NFL, you heard that right, in terms of the size that he has. Now, again, going to have to look more into that. But you can check out the GSMC Sports Podcast channel. I'll have to do some more research and record a short later today. So stay tuned for that. But that is all we have on these matchups. Let me know what you guys think about these past college games and who you have going forward here. But for now, we are going to be taking our first break of the show. And when we come back on the other side, we're going to be diving into the conversation around Joel Embiid and his imminent return from injury. So stick with us and we will be right back. <laughs> 